We are turning our Bibles to the book of Ruth, chapter 2. Ruth, chapter 2. And I will read a portion of scripture. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, who's a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech. Elim and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I might, I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hat was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they, had, they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and have continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. We'll stop here. This is God's word. Amen. We read in verse 1 of Ruth chapter 2, And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. I'm sharing a series from the book of Ruth. And I have entitled the entire series, The Gospel According to Ruth. This is message number four. The title for this message is Christ, our Redeemer. That's what, that's what we sung just now. In my personal study of the scriptures, I have become more convinced that the Old Testament is a historical parable. You have heard me say this many times. It is a historical parable, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. The events in the Old Testament are historical. Parables are not understood by casual reading of the Bible. They must be revealed by God. The professor in college cannot understand the Old Testament. Don't look for him to teach you the Old Testament or her. When one compares scripture with scripture, it is tedious work. God will reveal the gospel intent of his word. Parables are hidden truths in the Old Testament. Jesus said to his disciples in Mark 4, 11 through 13, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables. The word of God. So that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. And he said unto them, the disciples, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all parables? The whole Bible. The Bible is written to blind the unbeliever in the church. But the Bible is written for the believer to search and find truth. And that's why the unbeliever sees so many contradictions in the Bible. 
God contradicts himself. How do you expect me to do this? That's what you would see. Sometimes you are blown away by the word of God. And it is an honor to study the word of God for the people of God. James said, let not many of you be teachers, for you would receive the greater damnation. It's a fearful thing for me to stand here. Therefore, parables are not limited to those spoken by Jesus in the New Testament alone. The Bible is a parable given to God's people and not to everyone. The last time we concluded chapter 1 by considering the timely season of Naomi's return to Bethlehem. And somebody asked me what season we're in. I stood here and I explained that. And yet, someone's going to ask me, but what season are we in? Well, I'm sorry if you don't know what season we are in. But we saw this timely season of Naomi's return to Bethlehem. From chapter 2, we are introduced for the first time to Boaz, who was the great-grandfather of David. And this ought to tell you something. This is historical. Ruth chapter 1 was very theological, where we noted many Old Testament scripture references. Chapter 2 is more practical. Therefore, in our concluding thoughts this morning, we will share more of the practical applications from Ruth chapter 2. We'll be observing the introduction of Boaz. Second, we would make mention of the bold request made by Ruth. And third, we will consider the gracious words of Boaz to Ruth. We will consider these things today and we will make the sense of them as we go along. So come with me first to this introduction of Boaz, verse 1. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech. And his name was Boaz. Here we are introduced to the primary subject of the book. Boaz. Not Ruth, not Naomi. Boaz. Naomi had a relative named Boaz. He's more than a relative. The word kinsman means redeemer. He was a relative from the side of her husband, her late husband. Boaz can be traced back to Perez, the son of Judah. This means that Boaz is qualified to be a kinsman, a redeemer for Ruth, whose husband had died. And Boaz is qualified to buy back not only Ruth and Naomi, but the land that was sold when Elimelech take up and run and leave everything. So you get to understand the historical picture, Brother Charlie. He's described as a mighty man of wealth. Boaz may have owned many natural resources in the land of Judah. History tells us, according to Josephus, Prior to Naomi's move into Moab, there was no need for a redeemer. It was only after the death of her husband and the death of her sons, this came to light. Oh, you understand that she needs a redeemer. She needs somebody to buy back. Naomi is considering the provision made in the law of Moses about a widow who have lost her inheritance because of the death of her husband. Obviously, when Elimelech moved to Moab, 
He sold his land. He was going there for good. He was going to the States and he wasn't coming back. He had hindsight. Burn bridges behind him. And this made his decision even more rash. Like some of you make decisions. But never consulting your pastor or the Bible. These are moral truths that you should gather. Leviticus 25, 25 through 27 says, If thy brother be wax and poor and have sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin, here's the word again, kinsmen, come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. And if the man have none to redeem it, and himself be able to redeem it, then let him count the years of the sale thereof, and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it, that he may return unto his possession. The land supposed to stay in each tribe. You couldn't buy land in, out of another tribe. That's why this is important that this man, Boaz, was from Judah. Here in Ruth 2, verse 1, we are introduced to the prospect of one acting as a kinsman for Naomi who became bankrupt. By the way, do you know that you are spiritually bankrupt? Do you know that? Do you know that you have nothing to offer God? Do you know that you need a redeemer? Do you know that you need someone to buy you back from the slave market of sin? Do you know that? But this is only a moral picture. Who does this kinsman redeemer reminds us of? Who does he picture in the gospel setting? It is Christ who fits this description as Israel's redeemer, as our redeemer. Naomi is a picture of the nation of Israel. God was married to Israel in a sense. Naomi had lost her husband and was in desperate need of a redeemer. It is Jesus who fits this description of our redeemer. He is described of one of us, a relative, in that he became man and he is mighty in wealth. Christ owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The earth is his and he made it. He's called a mighty one because he is mighty to save. Today, though, Israel is blind in unbelief. There is still a redeemer. They have a redeemer that they can call on. Today we have a redeemer. Christ that we can call on. Lost it. We can call on him. No matter how young you are. You are lost. And you are headed for hell. But Christ came to redeem you from hell. Hear what the prophet says. And all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. Isaiah 49, 26. The prophet foresaw, foresaw this might of the Redeemer. He says rhetorically, Who is he that cometh from Edom? with thy garments from Basra, this that is glorious in his apparel. Well, that, that we're talking about the apparel of the priest. Here he is, traveling in the greatness of his strength. And then he says, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou ready in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth the wine fat. The blood. Oh, our Savior was marred with blood. Beyond recognition. And the prophet foresaw this and says, Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments like him that 
thread of the wine fat is none other than our Redeemer, the Lord, who trotted the wine press alone. You know, in order to extract the juice from the grapes, first they must be reaped. Then the grapes must be crushed in a wine press, Miriam. They must be crushed. Jesus was crushed for the sins of his people. He's mighty to save. That's why Isaiah said he was bruised. And that word bruised, he was crushed for our iniquities. What a savior. If this song that we sung, my Redeemer, did not bring tears to your eyes, nothing will. You know, we can do things with a lot of dry eyes and hard hearts. Naomi introduced Ruth to a national redeemer, kinsman, that points to the only redeemer. She's introducing us to a redeemer, Christ Jesus. He fits the virtues of the perfect redeemer. He was of the family of Elimelech. He was one of them. He was mighty to save. He was willing to save. Do I need to say more? Second, we want to see the bold request Ruth made. Verses 2 and 3. Our text says, And Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field, and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. Notice what she is seeking. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. All of a sudden, Naomi's words change. All of a sudden, she changed now. My daughter. Earlier, she was sending her away. She learned. And you better learn in your church about the people of God. We don't know one another. God has to teach us lessons. God doesn't own any bastards. Her request was not to be hired. She's an undeserving Moabite. Ruth had no rights in approaching this Redeemer. She's a stranger on the block. Has no part or inheritance in the promised land. Her request was to glean bits of corn that happened to fall on the ground behind the reapers. Ruth knew two passages in the Bible, the Old Testament. This tells me that Naomi was teaching her the Bible. What do you teach your children and your grandchildren? What do you teach them? She knew Leviticus 19, 9, and 10, and Deuteronomy 24, 19. And just in case, I'll read them. Leviticus 19, 9, and 10. And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of the field, neither shall you gather the gleanings of thy harvest. And thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shall thou gather every grape of thy vineyard, Thou shalt leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord. The children of Israel were commanded that when they reaped their harvest, they were not to retrieve the scraps that fell. You know, like some of us, we'll take, like Mabel, we we'll take up every aim. They were to leave them for the poor and the stranger. In God's mercy, he made provision for the stranger, the widow, the fatherless, the Gentiles. God was thinking about you and me. Ruth understood that God was a God to the fatherless, to the strangers, to the widows. 
That's faith. Psalm 68. We read this. Grace shines through the law. This law was repeated in Deuteronomy 24, 19. When thou cuttest down thine harvest in thy field, and hast forgot a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, for the widow, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thy hands. Gospel. You may remember that the Lord Jesus commended a woman of Canaan who understood that grace shines through the law. You know that very well, Matthew 20, Matthew 15, 25. Then came she and worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Yeah, Lord, that's true. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Same precept. She understood that. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O oh, woman, great is your faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. You know, sometimes you say things to people in the church. And the things you say may be harsh to their benefit, and they pack up and leave. You hear what she said? He said to this woman, the food I have is not for the dogs. But she said, yeah, you're right. I'm a dog. But the dog eat the crumbs that fall. That's an attitude of faith. Where the Bible says, great peace to those who love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. One of the reasons why many can be in the church and are not in a state of grace is because they see themselves of worth, as worthy of grace. My friend, we must learn from Ruth's humble requisition to her mother-in-law. This name it, claim it mentality that some teach on the, on, on the, on the um, religious networks, TBS or TBA. I hope none of you don't watch that rubbish. We need to see who God is and who we are before approaching him. Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. Seeking grace. Verse 3 tells us that along with her request, she displayed faith. This is the verse 3. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family, the country. Elimelech. The word hap means by chance. If by chance. Ruth trusted in divine providence. Her hope was that by chance, Boaz the Redeemer would have taken note of her. Oh yes. You and I don't simply join up the club. Like you have joined up this church. You and I should not think that we should be noticed. We know not God's providential will. We should say, if by chance he may notice me. He's not obligated to notice not one of us. Let me make that very clear. Oh, I'm so happy to have you in my church. You're such a nice person. No, you're not. Churches are crowded with people like that because men pastors butter them up. God resists the proud. 
gives grace to the humble. That's the gospel. It is meant to humble us and to glorify God. Any preacher that is doing the opposite, he's not preaching the gospel. What have we seen thus far in our exposition? We saw the introduction of the kinsman redeemer. He's of the family of Naomi. He's wealthy. He's mighty. He's a picture of our Redeemer who is mighty to save. Second, we saw this bull request of Ruth. Let me now go into the field of him whom I might find grace. And by chance, I may end up in his vineyard. Brethren, how can you have a dry eye with this? How can you preach from this if you're a Christian? Thirdly, the gracious words of Boaz. I would extend this last point a little more. Verses 4 through 9, because of its length. Verse 4, and behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. See, this man is a godly man. The Lord be with you. See what he wishes for his people. As a pastor. Should be godly men. The Lord be with you. And they answered him, the Lord bless thee. This is the people's response to their Savior. The Lord bless thee. We come to this church and we make a lot of racket. And pay attention to the word of God. Keep your head up. The man bore his status of this kind of status. He should not have even said anything to Ruth. Nothing. Who dare her to expect this wealthy, mighty man to inquire after her. Verses 5 to 8, then said Boaz to his servant that was said over the reapers, who damsel is this? And the servant that was said over the reapers answered and said, it is the Moabitess damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. You, know, you see this verse? This verse always tickles me. Especially verse 6. The answer the servant gave. It is if the servant, the overseer, was saying to his master Boaz, Are you sure you want to have dealings with this woman? Are, are you sure? This is the Moabite woman that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. Are you sure? You, are you sure you want to know who she is? As a matter of fact, Curtis was saying, partiality. This sounds like many of us today. This sounds like the servant of King Saul. Remember him, Ziba, when David asked, Is there any yet from the house of Saul that I may show mercy for David's sake? 2 Samuel 9, verse 3. The servant of Ziba said, Yeah, there's one. Saul has a grandson, but you don't need him. He's far, far away, and he's lame in his feet. You don't need that one. Here, what 2 Samuel 9, 3 says, The king said, Is there yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan have yet a son which is lame on his feet. In other words, He's no use to the kingdom. He can't bear arms. But the king did not ask you that. Grace and mercy never ask present condition of anyone. You come as you are to the Savior. This servant is like me and you. Partial. Unless you are, verse 7, the foreman over the reaper says of Ruth, 
the Moabite woman these words. And that's why she is remembered as she wrote the book of Ruth. The servant read on, and she said, I pray you, verse 7, I beg you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and have continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. She took her place as a stranger. She, she sought the Lord's station. I, 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 having heard these words, go and work all day, you know. Boaz exalts Ruth to the highest station. You see, be careful when you talk now, people. Be careful when you gossip about people. He elevates her to the highest station, verse 8. Then Boaz <laughs> said unto Ruth, Fearest thou not my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. God does not have orphans and stepchildren or cousins. He owns his elect as sons and daughters. Are you a daughter or a son of God? Are you, are you one? What give you the right? To be called a child of God. Have you repented of your sins? Or are you still in your sins? My daughter, the woman who touched the border of Jesus' garment with her filth, in an act of faith, to be cured was told by the Savior, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Same procedure, faith, trust, leaning upon. Here in roof, this curse, Moabite heard gracious words from Boaz. You know, Zechariah speak of this. Let me read it to you, Zechariah 9, 10. And he shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river even to the ends of the earth. Christ. Verse 9 continues. I go down to verse 10. Boaz said, let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap. <laughs> and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art a thirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Now these are wonderful words. They are gracious words that I just can't leave without exegeting them. Boaz offered three gracious rewards to Ruth. In verse 9, one was liberty to serve with the reapers. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them or behind them. This is grace. Ruth was to go after, not run ahead. Today, we have a cloud of witnesses to follow. Today, we have many good examples to follow. Go after them. It seems that people seek to follow bad examples in the church. Oh, he doing it. He come where he want. Our Savior has given us liberty to worship to serve him. This is what he did. Whoa. Let her loose. That's how you show your love. Second, Boaz offered Ruth protection from harassment. He said, 
Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? He shows this man had authority. A new damsel, a damsel is in town. This may arouse the interest of the male reapers. Who's this young one? Boaz knew his intentions for Ruth. He knew what he was going to do, and he doesn't want anybody to touch her. Christ knows what his intentions are for us. When we flirt with the world, Paul said of the Corinthians, For I am zealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, I think. There are deep lessons in these words. In many a congregation, there is a whole lot of unwholesome dating. Young men and women should keep themselves clean. There's a lot of touching in funny places. I talk to some of you. Let it be wholesome. Don't be found in a room with a member of the other's, uh, other sex, with a parent not around. He said, Well, yeah, you're talking about them. You, you, better talk, you better talk about those things. The junk on television that sometimes you see, so distasteful, you got to switch off the TV. A lot of unwholesome dating, especially in some denominations. Shotgun marriages. Marry quick, 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 or she's pregnant. This is moral information. Boy says, have I not commanded the young man not to touch you? Same thing Paul says, it's good that a man touch not a woman. But to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. Too much nonsense in the church. The third gracious reward Ruth received is the best. She was offered water freely. Freely. And when thou art a thirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. These rewards are no accident. They are gospel. You better find it. The gospel is freely offered. I should begin charging some of you to hear me preach. When you come here, I should be there, the deacon should be there picking up. But that would be in violation of God's word. Freely you receive, freely you give. There's some preachers that I know that is charged $300 a hit for a sermon. I must see more than that now, Brother Colin, maybe six. And they're not opening their Bible, but off me until they see a check. That's how some men are hopping from church to church to get a check. And I hope you're hearing me merchandising the gospel. They're not studying the scriptures. Hear this one. Go and drink freely. The words of Boaz are to teach that when one comes to faith and obedience to Christ for salvation, he gives gracious rewards on this side of eternity, the church. Liberty to serve. We become part of the body of believers endowed with the gifts of the Spirit. We are protected from wolves. We become partakers of the water of life freely. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that hears say, come. 
and let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Revelation 22, 17. This, brethren, is our exposition of Ruth 2. I went down to verse 9. Introduction of Boaz, who was a close relative of Naomi, a mighty man of wealth, willing to redeem. Who does he picture? Christ. Who did not take on the nature of angels, but was made of the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behoove him to be made like unto his brethren. Christ. He goes to and verse 10. We saw the bold request made by Ruth, who trusted in providence. Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. We saw the gracious words of Boaz. He offered liberty, protection, water to quench her thirst. When you work, you need water. We said that this chapter is more practical than theological. And we are aware that Ruth is a picture of a true believer. As a matter of fact, she's a picture of the New Testament church. We saw this in the first part of our series. Here in chapter 2, Ruth displays the characteristics of a child of God. And this should be of interest to us today. And this is what I will close with. First, we see her willingness to work. Ruth the Moabite has said to Naomi, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. To glean ears of corn is hard work in the hot, voiding sun, in the heat of the day. To glean is to gather the drips of corn from those who were reaping. Think of it in those days. The Bible says that God has provided the church apostles, prophets, pastors, teacher, teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Everybody want grace, but not too many want the work. Three ladies cleaning the floor every weekend, the same tree. Nobody wants the work. I miss Charlie, I know that. But Charlie, don't depend, don't depend on Charlie. A lot of you are strapping man. So a little snow come down, you don't even come to prayer meeting. You think I gonna buy that rubbish? I don't wanna hear. Work, willingness to work. Ruth was not willing to work to find grace. There's no such thing. The one who receives grace for their works, that's not grace. She's willing to work because God was gracious to her. That's why she was willing. God was gracious to her. So she was willing to work. He had already been gracious, coming all the way over there. Finding a place. This is always the motivation behind the believer's will to serve God. Grace. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, 
but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. No will to do God's will means no grace in your life, no salvation. However, I would have you consider the second virtue of this young woman who came from the country of Moab. She was cautious with whom she worked. She was cautious with whom she worked. Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. Not in whose sight I will find the things of this world, but grace. Verse 3 goes on to say, And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hat was to light on a part of field belonging to Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. There was a follow through to that which she requested. And she went and came, oh my friend, many make requests, but not many of us follow through. Many ask, but many do not receive because we ask amiss. We're not real in our asking. There some say they are children of God, but they are never cautious where they are gleaning. Not cautious of who they are following and listening to in the name of preaching. Not cautious about what church they are going to. Not cautious. Oh, are we all going to the same place? I wish we were. I wish we were. For broad is the way. That leads to destruction, and many be thereat, but narrow is the way that leads to life. Right now, we got a we got a situation right here, right now. Like that. And I wish you were here. Be not cautious. As a matter of fact, you don't even got the ability to know if you're gleaning grapes or bramble. You, you can't even understand my language. Don't come and ask me what it means to glean today. Children of God, and they're not cautious. I'm very cautious. Who oh, I put my ears on there. Not cautious about how they go, how they worship. If it is accepted, the drums, the special music. The entertainment. They say they're Christians. But they have become loose in their decisions. Mark these lessons well. Ruth characterizes the child of God. Willingness to work. Cautious with whom she worked. She gleaned. Thirdly, consistency in her work. Consistency in her work. Verses 5 through 7. Verse 5 says, Then said Boaz unto his servant, and said over the reapers, Who comes to this? As a man, you have to recognize that Boaz was not all knowing. He's a picture of Christ, but he's not all knowing. He inquires about Ruth. Who, who's this lady? Verse 6 and 7. The servant that was said over the reapers answered and said, it is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. Why well, has to be so extensive? And she said, I pray you let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheep. So she came and has continued even from morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. I, I have to explain the last phrase to you because I had some help in reading. Ruth was consistent in her work of gleaning. She was not an eye servant. 
you know, sometimes you turn your back on some on men, and, and you wonder they don't do what you tell them to do. The one who was set over the reapers took note of her consistency. In verse 7, she came and have continued even from morning until now. The New King James says it a little more clearly. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. <clears throat> the foreman of the reapers was not a slave driver. So he's, he permitted a break. Over the reverse, he allowed Ruth a time out, rest. Ministers of God are not slave drivers. Some of us think that servants of God are unreasonable. He permitted her to rest. The picture. Well, let me conclude, brethren, with final thoughts. By asking, have this Redeemer, uh, the true Redeemer, offered such grace to you? Their church person, has he given you liberty from the demands of the law? Have he given you liberty from the from the curse that we read about in Romans five? Have, have he given you liberty? Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. We enter. We enter His presence boldly. Have, have you have do you have that liberty? Ruth deserved to be cast aside. Who dare you come into my country from Moab asking for gleaning in the field? Who dared her to approach this mighty man of wealth? Has the Lord of glory spoken graciously to you, to your soul, my daughter? If he has, you would have a willingness to serve. You would have a willingness to be consistent. He said, abide in, in my maidens. Jesus said the same thing, abide in me. For without me, you can do nothing. Abide, stay, remain, continue. Has the Lord of glory spoken like this to me and you? I don't know. Has the Lord offered you protection from the wrath to come? Have I not commanded them not to touch you? There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ, to those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Is this you? I would like to know. And finally, are you drinking from the water of life? There are a lot of wells out there. I remember one time I said, well, you got to smile, yeah? I wanted this guy carry us to get some water from a spring in Africa. I remember he said, well, this is calling, don't drink that, man. That water got in a lot of cow feces and everything. There are a lot of Gospels out there like that. Called down all, all kinds of people walking through it. Like the prophet says that the priest in Ezekiel's there muddy up the waters, foul up the waters. And many preachers have fouled up the Gospel. Trampling through it with their feet. Are you drinking freely of the water of life? Freely. Some people don't even like the gospel, the, the true gospel. Stay away from those wells. They might be very costly. Bacteria. 
whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into eternal life. That's the water that I'm speaking about. Brethren, may the Lord of glory be pleased to open our eyes to these truths that are seen about our Redeemer. Let us pray. Amen. Father, we thank you for the gospel and the meaning of the word of God to our souls. We bless you, O God, and we pray that you will continue to help us to see our need for Christ. And Lord, grant us that humble spirit as you granted this woman to come all the way from Moab to seek grace, to humbly seek grace. And may we seek your grace even now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.